Okay, now we're going to see part two uh, of cash organization. Part two. Um, let's start with a general organization. Okay, so as I said before, the cash has a certain number of sets, that's where data can go, and each set has a certain number of lines or blocks. By the way, line or blocks, cash block or cash line mean the same thing. Okay, I might use them interchangeably. Um, so a set has a number of uh, lines, which is the same thing as the way. If I say a cache is a four-way associative, it means that we're going to have one, two, three, four uh, lines in a set. Okay. So when a cache has two, like two, two to the S sets and two to the E lines. Okay. So um, now in each each line in the cache has a bit of metadata, right? The first one is the tag that we saw in the previous video, right? The tag uh, encodes, stores the rest of the address that cannot be figured out just with the sets alone, okay? So we know what data was stored in that block of the cache. There's also a valid bit here. The valid bit is used to determine whether, whether the data stored here, stored in the, in the data part of the is valid or not. For example, when the cache starts up, it starts up empty. So if there's some random addresses there, we don't do that to get, to get confused with real, with valid data. So this valid bit is all set to zero. This valid bit is also used in the context of multi-cores when we might have to invalidate uh, data when there's remote updates, but this is a subject of a more advanced computer architecture class. But the valid bit is also used in the context of multi-processors. Finally, um, so, the, there's two to the B bytes um, in, a, in a cache line, okay? So the reason we're using powers of two here is such that it will be easier to figure out how many bits we're gonna need for, for, for the address, okay? Uh, and uh, a cache line, uh, so a cache block here in our example is, uh, has as many bytes as the value of this B variable here. So that means that the cache size is S, with the total number of sets, multiplied by the number of ways or the number of lines per set, multiplied by the size of the block, capital B. Let's see how cache read works now. There's multiple steps in a cache read. When the processor sends an address to the cache to be uh, looked up, the first thing the cache has to do is locate the set uh, where the, the, the data goes, okay? So um, remember that we saw in the previous example determining where the data goes, we found there's some we saw that there's some bits of the address that are used to determine in which sets the data goes, okay? And those bits are here in the middle, right? So we're gonna have S bits, because if I have two to the, two to the S, little s sets, I'm gonna use little s bits as the set index, okay? So I'm gonna use that part of the address as an index to um, the cache, which is, so if this is zero, one, two, until you know, S minus one, and we use that value to determine which set here we're going to, to choose, okay? Once we do that, what we're going to do is we're going to see whether the, the tag of the address, this T bits, the upper part of the address, matches the tag stored in the block. And, um, okay, so that's, that's what we're going to do. Now, um, and then we're gonna use the the lower part of the address, the block offset, to, to determine which part of the block um, we are going to read. Because, you know, as I said, a cache block or a cache line can be 16, 32, 64 bytes, but often we read one register's worth of data, which could be four or eight bytes, or maybe one byte only. So we have to get only part of the block, okay? So let's see now how this works. I'm, gonna, I'm going to show how this works for a direct mapped cache, okay? With a direct mapped cache, there's a single block per set, okay? So what we're going to do is we start with our address, okay? So we're gonna get find the set, okay? so it happens to be 0001 here, so it's probably 01. And uh, we know that we're interested in this line here. What is the next step? Well, the next step is to determine, is to read that, select that line, and then determines whether the tag matches, okay? If the tag, if the T bit, the upper part of the address matches the tag stored in the cache, if it matches, we have a hit. If it doesn't match, we have a miss, okay? 
So the next step, and so if doesn't if if it matches and the bit is valid, we have a hit. Okay. If either one of these is not true, if it's either not valid or it's not a match, it's going to be a miss. Okay. So now let's assume that the cache block size is eight bytes, which means that now here we have eight bytes. Okay. So now depending on what's going to happen, we're going to use the block offsets to determine that happens to be one zero zero zero. We're interested in this part of the address, so that's what we're going to read. So these are the four bytes that are going to be read in this um, in this example. Okay, great. So now, uh, if there's no match, if it's a, if it's a cache miss, what's going to happen? The old line, whatever was here, is going to be scraped away. It's going to be thrown away. And the data that comes back from memory is going to come back and replace the data that was there. OK, now we know how, this wor how reads work on direct mapped cache. Let's see how reads work uh, on a set associative cache, okay, in a generic E-way set associative cache. Okay? And in, in our example here, let's make E equals 2. It means that it's a two-way set associative cache. Uh, that means I have two lines per set. Now I have two lines per set. Okay. What is the first thing we're going to do? Again, we're going to use the middle part of the address to find which set it goes. Let's say that it goes again to, to set uh, 1. But now what we're going to do, we're going to select this, this set here. Now we are focusing on two lines. Now that means that the data here can go in two places in the cache. So the comparison with the T bits of the address, with the tags, now has to involve two values. Now we're doing two comparisons, okay? So, and then we're going to do the same thing. If either one of them is valid and, uh, and uh, has a match, then we have a, a hit. Could be neither one of them. Of course, we're not going to have both of them, otherwise it's probably there's a bug in your cache. It should be either one or the other, but not in both. Okay, so it should be a match in only of them. But if both of them is a, uh, have a miss, they do not either don't match or the bit is invalid. The valid bit is set to zero. Then it's a cache miss. Okay, so let's say that we determine that this is a hit. So now the same thing, we're going to get the data. So now it just have we we happen to do a two byte. Uh, we do short int, right? Reading only two bytes. That's where the offset starts. We're going to get these two bytes here, read it, and send it to the processor. Okay. So if there's no match, one, uh, one line, one of those is selected for, for eviction and replaced. As I said before, uh, we normally use this policy called least recently used. Okay. okay. Now let's look at, this, at types of cache misses. There are many types of cache misses. Okay? The, there's three types, not many, three types. Okay? That's what we call the three C's of cache misses. There's actually a fourth one when we see multiprocessors, but uh, so that might be for another time. Um, the first type of miss is uh, called code miss or compulsory miss. That's a miss. There's nothing you can do about it. So it's a code miss. It's the first time you access the data, we haven't seen it before, so it's a miss. That's the first time you see the data. In fact, I, I lied. It's not that you cannot, can, you cannot do anything about it. There's some techniques called prefetching that can reduce that. But uh, typically, a code miss is hard to avoid and uh, just because the first time you access a block. Now, a conflict miss is a miss that happens just because of the cache organization. When you have multiple addresses that map into the same set, um, one could kick the other one out. When that happens, you're during conflict. Okay, conflict is normally not a good thing. And in the case of caches here, they just kick each other out. Kick each piece of data, so that's going to reduce the effectiveness of your cache. Okay? So, um, and uh, for example, if it's just one, if it's a direct mapped cache, you have more conflict misses. As you increase the set associativity, the number of ways in your cache, okay, uh, you're going to have a lower conflict miss because there will be fewer cases where data will kick other useful data out. Okay? So conflict misses happen when cache is large enough, but multiple data objects map to the same slot. Okay? Great. Now the final type of cache miss is a, a capacity miss. A capacity miss just means that the amount of data that you cycle through, that you access repeatedly, which is called the working set data, is larger than the cache. So fundamentally, you'll be kicking things out. Okay? So one way to think about conflict misses is, by the way, if you increase the associativity and the miss will go away, it's because there was a conflict miss. Okay? 
Um, so far, we have talked only about reads, but writes are very important too. Okay? The most important thing about writes is that the data might occur in multiple places. Okay, so um, if I uh, have, for example, I have my CPU, and I have my L1 cache, L2 cache, and so on. If I access a certain piece of data A here from the CPU, the data is going to be stored in the L1 eventually and the L2 as well. Now, but this, this is what I'm reading, reading A. But what happens when I say I now write to A? If I write only here, I'm going to disagree what's here and vice versa. Okay, so the main problem is that the copies of the same data spread over the caches in the hierarchy might disagree with each other. That's not a good thing. Disagreement is not a good thing. Okay? So, um, so what to do in a write hit? That's an important question. There's two basic policies. One's called write through, which that means that if I say I have my CPU here and I have an L1 cache, and then here in our example, say that in this example, say they have memory, when a processor says write a, so the CPU sends data straight to memory. Might have to update whatever is in the in the L1 cache, but it sends data always to memory. And the bad thing about that is that um, every time the CPU writes to something, it has to always go to memory, even if it's in the cache, right? So because it's a it's in the cache, you do both. You write through immediately to immediately write it to memory, updating the cache. Okay. Now write back works as follows. Um, this is write through with write back. When the CPU writes to A here, it just writes to the cache. And, then, and now there's a little bit here that gets set that says, okay, I've, this data is now dirty. It means that the copy in memory might not be the same. So whenever this line is displaced, it's kicked out of the cache, it goes and sends the data to memory. Okay, so we need a dirty bit to indicate uh, the line is different. Okay? So. Um, now, this is what we do in a write hit. But to do in a write miss, you have two options. One is called write allocate. In other words, should we load the data in the cache first and then do the write? Or, uh, and that's good because if you're going to uh, write and then do more writes, that's a good thing because we allocated the data. Okay? Now, uh, the other option is no write allocate. So you just write, uh, if it's a miss, it just writes to memory, you don't do anything to the caches. Okay? Um, and another another way the write allocate is useful too is if you do a read if you do a write that's later going to do a read that's a good thing because it's likely to be in the cache. So typical caches are either write back with write allocate usually that's that's a common case although write through and no write allocate occasionally you see that especially in some machines that have multiple processors. Um, to end this video let's revisit the Pentium the not Pentium the core i7 cache hierarchy. Okay? Remember that I showed you there were multiple L1 caches, L2 caches, you know, and there's an L3 cache shared by all of the cores. But now we can understand some of the other data here. When I said that the L1 is A to A sets associative, okay? that means that both the L1, uh, the, the data L1 and the instruction L1, the D cache and I cache, are both set associative, they're not direct maps. And that's a pretty high associativity, right? Because uh, the designers decided that it was worth throwing the complexity to reduce the type of misses and to, to reduce conflict misses. Okay? Now, the L2 unified caches, and by the way, the L1 cache is 32 kilobytes each. The L2 cache is eight times bigger, and it's also uh, a to A associative. And notice that the access time of the L1 is four cycles, the access time of the L2 is 11 cycles. Okay? Now, the L3 is uh, already much, much bigger. We're talking about 8 megabytes and even higher associativity to have even lower conflict misses. And that's because the, um, well, the, the, the access time is, uh, is also much, much slower than the, the L2. But the reason that the L3 also has much higher associativity is you want to reduce the misses. When you reach the L3, you better hit because if you don't, you have to go to memory, which is much, much more expensive. Okay? And the block size here is 64 bytes in all cases. Okay, see you soon.